Episode 360, Wildland Trekking in Tanzania with Seth Quigg. Um, so we keep making noise. The buffalo kind of dispersed a little bit. We have to change our route, go back up this ridge, and kind of reroute ourselves. And we ended up like busting out into a clearing. Uh, and that time, the moon was shining and the grass was glistening. And we look up and see this whole tribe of Maasai warriors running at us. And we're like, "What's what's what do we do here? You're listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast, brought to you by 180 Tech. We talk with adventurers from around the globe to bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to get started in the outdoors or to keep you moving if you're already there. Now here's your host, Kurt Linville. Hey friends, thanks again for listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast. Kurt here. I've got Seth Quigg on the line today, and I'm I'm uh, really excited to talk to Seth about adventure travel. He is a world traveler extraordinaire. He has been to dozens of countries. He's made a career out of guiding trips internationally. And what's really cool is he also spent a lot of time in Crested Butte, and so... That makes him a, a friend from close to home, but he's out of Asheville, North Carolina now. But we are excited to visit today about adventure travel, especially we're going to focus a little bit on Tanzania. And Seth is, uh, Seth, are you a founding partner of Wildland Trekking? Would you say that? Well, I'm a founding partner of Wildland Trekking International, which is a subsidiary of Wildland Trekking. There you go. Founding partner of Wildland Trekking International, and we're going to let you know what that is toward the end of the show, too. So, Seth, welcome to the program, man. Thank you, Kurt. Happy to be here. Yeah, you bet. So, wow, Seth, let's start, I guess, by talking a little bit about your travel resume, just so people get a feel for this. I mean, Tanzania, you've been there like four times. You're headed back there this year. You were there a year ago. You've led over 10 expeditions to the Himalayas, been to Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand. What what have I missed? There's a whole bunch more. Uh, I spent a lot of time in uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, on the island of Borneo, a lot of places in Sub-Saharan Africa, Madagascar, Morocco, um, all over South America, all over North America, Central America, pretty much lots of places except Europe and Antarctica. <laughs> except Europe. And most people in the U.S. with a passport would say, well, I've been to Europe. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, my, resp- my response is that I'm saving that until I get older. <laughs> there you go. There you go. You know, right. I love fly fishing, but I say the same thing about fly fishing. I, I do some of it now, but I'm, I'm kind of saving that for when I get older. <laughs> Absolutely. And you're in a good spot to do it. Gunnison, Gunnison has a great fly fishing. Well, it's cool because you were just telling me that you guys are starting up an accredited program at Western Western Colorado State University, um, or is it Western State Colorado University? I always get it confused, but anyway, what tell us what that program is? Yeah, so we are we're starting an accredited guide course with Wildland Trekking. Uh, we get tons of of guests that are doctors, lawyers, you know, X Y Z. And they're always like, you have the best job in the world. I want to do that job. And so, we, you know, I hear that all the time. And um, it just makes sense to, to teach people how to be hiking guides and, and what goes into it as far as logistics and planning and risk management and the interpersonal skills you need to have. So we're partnering with Western State um, to form this guide course that where people can get credit for it. And so that would be. There's lots of different thoughts about the course itself. We might market it to um, university students, um, but it's not solely for for university students. It it can be people that want to change their career or um, that just want this experience, you know, to to maybe maybe it's for them to go out on personal trips. They want to learn the skills associated with doing it themselves. And so. Through this course, they'll be able to learn the skills necessary Neat. for that. Yeah. I love that. Well, let's talk about why people would be interested by diving into your background, your story about traveling all over the planet. 
I guess, first of all, we got to get more background. How did you fall into a position where you could do this much travel? That's amazing. Yeah, it, it is a lot. It's a long story. Um, but I guess I, I have a couple pivotal points in my life. I think the first one is I went to university at Appalachian State uh, in the mountains of Western North Carolina. Um, and there I really fell in love with the mountains and the curiosity of what's around that next corner or what's down that river. And so I got a degree, a bachelor's degree in recreation management and technical photography. Um, and just like my world opened up to, to exploration and became passionate about exploring different lands. And, um, initially it was like all recreation focused. And so I started guiding on the rivers, um, raft guiding and kayak guiding out in California and a little bit in North Carolina. So I'd spend my summers out West and then, yeah, I mean, I did that for probably four years guiding, hiking. Then I got a job in Montana, the university of Montana and would spend the summers. It was a seasonal job. So spend the summers guiding Alaska mountain guiding and sea kayak guiding. And so I just kept scaffolding on my skill set until i think 2008 i took an instructor course with the the national outdoor leadership school and started teaching for them kind of part-time and at the same time i moved to australia (laughs) where i started working for another company called world challenge expeditions and so i basically pieced together noel's work with world challenge work for about six or seven years, which was really brilliant. Like my main goals were to travel and, and work with people, Mm. um, in in an outdoor capacity. And so it really was like the ultimate dream job to put, you know, I was based in Australia. I could go lead these months long expeditions to Borneo, you know, fly back to Australia, work some Knowles courses in the Boreal summer, and then fly it up. Africa and Nepal and just all over. I think one year, like 2013, I was in 20 different countries in one (laughs) year, which is like, you know, it's a whirlwind, especially to reflect back on. You know, I I look at that and I think that's almost too much. You know, I remember when I took a trip (laughs) to Kenya and we were there for five weeks. So it was kind of extended trip, but at the same time, it wasn't long enough. And then we got back to the States and I was like kind of processing that for i don't know years <laughs> you know what i mean right it's such yeah, an impact on your life when you go places like that i can imagine 20 in a year that's amazing yeah yeah it gives you a lot of ammo to reflect back on you know and i think through reflection you start to to learn about what you like and you can make, making sense of it all yeah um and so i eventually went to graduate school to study cross-cultural studies within adventure education um and I used Knowles and World Challenge uh, to help me with, I, you know, I used World Challenge to do my research on, and then I worked with Knowles to, on their cultural curriculum as well. So I had this external support, which was brilliant um, for my, my thesis and overall studies. Nice. But then, yeah, so then I continued to work for Knowles and World Challenge up until, well, Knowles 2015. And, you know, I was like trying to figure it out. I was like, all right, I got, you know, have, I still have amazing options to go travel around the world and, you know, go on these amazing adventures. But I'm, you know, I'm getting a little burned out. I'm getting older. What do I want in my life to look like in the next five years? And so I was thinking, I, was like, I don't have a partner. Uh, it'd be nice to have a girlfriend, you know, maybe a, maybe a place to pay rent. And so I tried <laughs> to move back to North <laughs> right. Tried to move back to North Carolina to Asheville um, and was actually running a trip on the Grand Canyon on the, on the Colorado River. Flew back to Asheville in a woofer research, wilderness first responder medical research. And the guy is sitting right beside me, his name's Chris Hoga. And we start talking. And he's like, You know, where are you from? I was like, Well, I'm originally from North Carolina. I just flew in from Flagstaff. And he's like, Dude, I moved to Flagstaff like a week ago. And I was like, well, that's funny. What, what are you doing here? He's like starting a branch of wildland trekking in Western North Carolina, Tennessee. And so he started telling me about it. And I'm, you know, we lead these awesome hiking vacations in the Smoky Mountain National Park. And 
I was like, oh man, well, I know how to do that really well. And so we started working together and immediately we just started killing it. Like we ran probably 40 to 50 trips the first season. Wow. Yeah. That first spring, we just started killing it. And so what it, what it allowed, what it provided for me was better pay and shorter trips. So I could run these like three to seven day trips, make pretty good money and have a different kind of lifestyle, but parallel to what I was living. And so let's see, where, do, where what happens after that? So we start working. I'm still working with Knowles. I had one, my last Knowles trip in Utah that May and had my last world challenge trip in Ecuador that June. I met a woman that May. Um, she had just gotten a job at Western State um, and I would led my trip in Ecuador, came back to Asheville, got in my truck and drove to Crested Butte, Colorado, <laughs> where I, where I didn't leave and moved in with her like immediately. So you found the, the home and the gal and everything. I had the, I had the, I had the, the gal, the step dog. And at that same time, Kurt, um, I wrote a proposal to the three owners of Wildland Trekking, um, telling them, you know, my experience and cause me and Chris Hugg the guy in Asheville, we'd always sit around and talk about why are we not running trips internationally? Like I've done this for 10 years. I've got all the connections, all the logistics died. Why are we not doing that? And so I wrote a thorough proposal to the three owners and we negotiated and talked about it for a couple months and incorporated in that October, 2015. So I went from like being a vagabond dirt bag to having a awesome place in Crest Butte, a beautiful girlfriend and a business owner in like six months. I love it. I love the stories when people are doing what they love to do and eventually they, they sort out an angle where they can uh, build a business around it, you know, and start naming their own terms a little bit more and continuing to do what they love to do. But I just think it's amazing when people are able to build a career and a lifestyle that allows them to do what they love. You know, I think it's so cool. Absolutely. I know, I mean, people, people are always like, that's just like a, a crazy story, you know, that, that, you know, they're kind of, and I'm still blown away too. Sometimes I'll wake up and I'm like, does this really what I'm doing with my life? Like that, it, and I, you know, I've always, I've always been, and I've always had the mindset that as long as you're building your interest and in your skill set on itself like if you're doing something that you're passionate about um or interested in like things will work out yeah yeah no i think you're right you have to be patient you know and you have to watch for opportunities but you know what do they say that luck is it's it's when preparedness meets opportunity or something like that you know that's exactly i was about to say that yeah my (laughs) father my father always says that luck is where opportunity meets preparation there you go and that's what's happening in your life i've got to tell our listeners before we go on because I've got the full audio-visual experience going here because I'm looking at your Instagram page. So if you're not driving your car right now, then go to Instagram while you listen to this and look at Seth's pictures here. So you go to, it's Seth Quig Photography, right, on Instagram? Yeah, you got it. So thousands of pictures from all over the world, and you see people from every background and culture, landscapes, um, all the stuff that you would expect you know, from a, a lifetime of world travel, it's all right there. So that'll give you a backdrop for what Seth is talking about. So, it, and it just blows my mind, Seth. I'm looking at every one of these pictures going, ooh, I want to go there. Ooh, I want to go to there. Ooh, I want to go right. there. <laughs> you know? Right. I, I used to be really into the the outdoor. I'm still into the outdoor adventure aspect of it. But what I'm what I'm really interested in is is in the people, man. Right. Like the people are a, n- a natural part of the environment and shape the shape the natural environment in so many ways that, I mean, they would they would just be more hollow places without the people. And so my interest led me to to that and understanding cultures and um, you know what you what you can really learn from from people in, in terms of your intercultural competency and how that affects students. Like when I used to take students abroad and even now that I take guests abroad, like just witnessing the cultural exchanges is one of my favorite things. You know, I think it's really important for the world 
um, at this day and age, and probably always has been, but just to, to get out and experience different parts of the world where people are, so you think different, super different than you, and that sure, there are differences, but there are a lot of similarities as well. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a great, it's a great thing to, for people to, to, to learn about, you know? Yeah. Well, Hey, let's, let's unpack that a little bit more because I'm a big believer in travel and in that intercultural exchange, especially for Americans, U S citizens. And the reason I say that is because we're one of the most under-traveled countries in the Western countries on on the planet. I'll say it that way. Um, yeah. It's real easy to uh, enjoy the United States. It has such a vast diversity of landscapes, but it doesn't really have that vast of a diversity of cultures. I mean, we're, we have a lot of different cultural backgrounds represented here, but we're the melting pot, you know, and we're kind of all one. And as you travel and you see how other people live in other places, there's a big life impact there. Why do you think it's valuable for people to do that? Uh, I mean, just, just to expand the five senses. Uh, when I was working on my master's, uh, you know, I did the comparison and contrast between outdoor skills and intercultural skills, as we call them. Um, and one thing we found is that, you know, if you put someone on the side of a mountain with a decision making responsibility or you put them in the Delhi train station having to make decisions like you can get leadership outcomes out of that. And, mm. and so putting someone in a different environment um, really unlocks the brain into learning, I think. Um, does that answer the question? I think it does, at least in part. You know, it's so multifaceted, right? Right. Well, also, I mean, I think that the world is very diverse in its in the countries. Um, I mean, the, just the, in every country around the world, there is tons of diversity. For example, in India, I mean, you've got people in southern India that are very different to central India that are very different to the people in the Himalayas and then very different to the people in the trans Himalaya way up north on the border of Pakistan. And then out east in eastern India, it's, it's very, very diverse. Um, so that might not be something that people realize when you, you know, you're sitting in the United States thinking about India, you might just think about what comes to mind. And so by really going to a place, you can really get more in depth of your understanding of what actually is going on around the world. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. India is a good example too. Like you said, second most populated country on the planet with more diversity. I looked up the other day, I don't even remember, but how many languages are spoken there. And I don't know how many hundred it is. It, you know, it's just like, wow, it's vast. And right. So and I would say, say, oh, i go to India. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> India is a, a world into itself. Right. And I think that's the brilliant thing about travel is that you can find, you just, you, you learn more, you know, it's, it's the best classroom, um, out there for me. Like I, I was never a good traditional student. You know, my teachers would always rag on me because I couldn't sit still in class. And I was always like cutting up and, uh, making my friends laugh. Cause that's what was important to me as a kid. You know, it wasn't like, what's, what's the square root of blah, blah, blah. I was like, I want to go and talk to people and, and, you know, really have that. Um, I mean, it's, it's being a kid, but zooming out now, it's all about emotional intelligence, right? Yeah. Um, and what does, what does education, like there's so many different styles of education and what really matters, you know, like if I would have had that coach that was teaching me about my emotional intellect back in the day, instead of math, then maybe, you know, I would have started earlier or something like that, you know. What do you mean by emotional intellect? Just out of, Let's unpack that. Yeah, I think it means, to me, it means like how I interact with the world. My, my, this, my interpersonal skills, um, my, my responses to the world, um, and how I, how I can make things happen. You know, how you can, how you can see your goals and know how to network with the right people to, to make things happen. I think that's a skill that we, we need to work on, um, further with quote unquote traditional education. Mm, yeah. It'd make the world a, a different place, wouldn't it? If people yeah, encounter I mean, and interact with each other. It wouldn't, it wouldn't box people in as much. 
you know? And I used to get a lot, a lot of like negative feedback that was like, well, Seth's not really bright because he's not performing at this, you know, paper written test. Right. And so yeah. if you could teach people through experiential education, through having these experiences, um, for example, you take somebody on a, a 12 day trek um, with, you know, with a facilitator, you know, briefing and debriefing that. And then they reflect on it. We were talking about reflection. So then reflecting on it, what did they learn and then how to apply that back into the next situation where it may come up? Like I'm a, I'm a firm believer in ex- that you learn through experience which is called experiential education. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've heard it also called coyote learning. Have you heard that term? No, I haven't. It's kind of the idea that you learn the hard way. I mean, we just got a new puppy, and this is kind of an example. So we go running off in the woods, and he stepped on his first cactus. I said, okay, now he knows not to step on a cactus. <laughs> that's that's kind of coyote learning. It's experiential. You go out and you try things, right. and that's how you learn it. Instead of someone telling you about it, right, you learn it by experience. Well, that's it. Yeah, that's an interesting thing, Kurt. That's, that's, I mean, it brings up a, an interesting thing to me. I mean, I think it's the definition of um, stupidity. It might not be stupidity but, or insanity. I think it's stupidity. But when you have a – let's say you have a negative experience like sitting on a cactus where, <laughs> where okay, you reflect on it and you keep doing it, right? right. You yeah. don't make a change. And, and I think you can, you can see that, that in um, – we are. You can see that in certain political structures as well, where you have something bad happen, you think about it, and you don't make a change, and something bad happens again. Yeah. You don't make a change. You think about it, you don't make a change, and something bad happens again, right? There's not learning happening there. And a lot of the uh, travel, I'm looking through your pictures still here, and a lot of the decisions you have to make when you're up on these mountains and in, in these different places, I mean, you can't repeat mistakes. You're going to end up hurting somebody, hurting yourself. You've got, you actually have to become an expert at what you're doing. You do. You absolutely do. But you also, you, you have to, you have to go with the flow. You know, I think that's one of the biggest learning in travel is, is to go with the flow and in the midst of adversity, what does it look like when, you know, when craziness is happening around you? Yeah. It's all about how you hold yourself. And that's one skill that, that we teach is, um, to be tolerant of adversity and uncertainty. And I think that travel is like provides the best opportunity. You know, what what if your train doesn't come? What if you go the wrong way? You know, what if it starts dumping snow or dumping rain? Like, how do you handle yourself in terms of adversity? Do you complain or do you sing a song? Yeah. You know, and that that that's a it's a valuable leadership skill to be to be in control of your emotions. Well, adventure begins, at least in part, where the expected ends, right? <laughs> when things don't go the way that you expect they're going to, that's often when it, the adventure gets really intense and, and often most memorable. That's At least that's my opinion on that. Absolutely. We're not fortune tellers, but when you lace up our new Stronghold work boots, it's easy to see that the future looks strong. We're Danner, and after 85 years of making boots for the unforgiving Pacific Northwest, well, that means our boots come with deep roots. And the new Stronghold work boot does just that. This is what happens when iconic quality runs into modern technology. You get tomorrow's classic today. Get into the Stronghold for strength that starts right from where you stand. Find your local store at danner.com. Bentgate Mountaineering is prepared to help you get ready for your epic winter. Come check out the latest in Alpine Touring, Telemark, NTN, and Splitboarding gear. They have brands like Black Crows, DPS, Dinafit, G3, Icelandic, K2, Technica Blizzard, Arcteryx, Mammoth, Solomon, Vole, Never Summer, Jones, and BCA. And you do need to be safe out there. Bentgate has the latest in avalanche safety gear. They have beacons, airbags, shovels, and probes, and they're ready to help you educate yourself on snow safety. They also rent out gear, so you can get your skis and your boots there, as well as your avalanche safety equipment. What's more, they also have free demo ski days at local resorts, so you can try out the latest gear. Now, how much fun does that sound? So swing by Bentgate in Golden, Colorado, or go to bentgate.com to find your new gear, as well as to get updates on all of their events. While hiking along the Appalachian Trail, fellow adventurer and podcast listener Scott Newman faced an age-old problem that we're all familiar with, foggy eyewear. So he did something about it. 
He solved that problem with Sven Can C's anti fog solution. Biodegradable, odorless, and 100% guaranteed, Sven Can C is the solution for all four seasons across all lens types. Go to SvenCanC.com today and enter promo code ADVENTURE to get two bottles for the price of one. That's S V E N Can C.com. Let's dive into some stories, man. I want to hear some stories that you've collected from all of these travels. And we said we we're going to focus on Tanzania. You've been there a, a bunch of times, right? You're working on number five or something right. like that. So how about a story that would kind of help us understand what Tanzania is like? Okay, cool. I have a, I have a really good one that comes to mind. Um, so let's say, let's, let's set the, set the stage we are in the Ngorongoro Conservation Area, which is in northern Tanzania, adjacent to Serengeti, Serengeti National Park. And we are hiking. There's probably five males, five females. And we're hiking in a pretty uh, – an area that's very populated with wildlife. And so we hear an elephant trumpet, and all of a sudden we start yelling. So when you hear – when you when you're around animals in the outdoors, you start yelling to make noise so they'll run away so they know you're there. So we start yelling. All of a sudden, the earth starts shaking. Um, never felt the earth shake like that before. Uh, so we drop our packs, jump in a tree, and what happened is a, a herd of Cape buffalo had split our group. Half had went in front, and half of them had went behind us. Wow! And so at that, yeah, it was it was pretty full on. And so th- at that time, it's probably like five o'clock at night. Sun sets at six, and so we're in the trees for probably twenty minutes or so. Um, and then we're like, all right, well, we have to do something. Um, so we keep making noise. The buffalo kind of disperse a little bit. We have to change our route, go back up this ridge and um, kind of reroute ourselves. And we ended up like busting out into a clearing. Uh, and that time the moon was shining and the grass was glistening. And we look up and see this whole tribe of Maasai warriors running at us. And we're like, What's, what's, what do we do here? Um, and so my, my, my Tanzania program manager, actually now we've developed a good, a great relationship over the years. He was with us and he's a half Maasai. And so the Maasai had actually heard us yelling to scare away the animals and thought we were in trouble and they had come to, to help us. Nice. Yeah. So we ended up going back to their Bomas and, and having some honey beer and, and camping out with them for the night. <laughs> well what caused the what caused the their cape buffalo cape buffalo yeah what caused them to run in your direction were they being chased by some sort of a predator or something you know i don't think they were i think that they were probably just hanging out in the forest and when they heard us yelling that spooked them and then they just took off okay yeah well and so now you get to camp with the maasai yeah then we get to go hang out with the maasai which is great um <laughs> Another kind of story that is, is the day after this. So during that trip, you know, on, on trips, on outdoor adventures, you get really close with people. And um, it's pretty common in, in East Africa to, to give your, your friends a, a nickname. And so I call my, my best, my Tanzanian brother, I call him Nyani, which is baboon in, in Kiswahili. And he calls me Pimbi, which is a hyrax. It's a little like, um, like a rodent. Not, yeah, it's it's not a rodent, but it looks like a groundhog. And so everybody starts calling me Pimby. Um, and so that's like I'm known as Pimby all through East Africa. But going back to the story, the day after that stampede, we're going hiking, and we meet this guy Mamoya, and Mamoya knows um a group of bushmen called the Hadzabe tribe, and so he invites us to come hunting with the Hadzabe. And they're the only, they're the last Khoisan tribe in East Africa. And Khoisan meaning they they speak speak a clicking language. Wow. And live live way out in the bush. And so we go with Mamoya, we meet the Hadzabe tribe. Um, and they are like, Would you guys like to come hunting with us? And so we're like, Absolutely. Of course we of course we do. So we take off, running through the savannah. Um, 
looking for any animals to shoot. And it starts raining. And so we pull under this big overhanging rock and the guys make a fire, you know, really, really rapidly. And they start singing this good fortune hunting song. And it kind of, it goes like this. Dingy, dingy, mulani, yeah, dupe, dingy, mulani, yeah, dingy, dingy, mulani, yeah, dupe, dingy, mulani, yeah. And then because I'm a pretty outgoing person, everybody's like, Pimby, Pimby, you get up and sing. So I get up around the fire and I'm like, Pimby, Pimby, Mulani, yeah, Pimby dancing. And I'm doing the Pimby version of this Good Fortune hunting song. And immediately after that, a Pimby comes out from under this rock, runs out th- across this rock. We shoot it and kill it. They cut his foot off and make a necklace um, for me to wear and give me a monkey tail and a bunch of jewels. They thought that I was the Pimby master and that I'd summon the Pimby. <laughs> so now you're like the witch doctor or something. I am the Pimby master. Yep. And so <laughs> every time I go back, I, I see all my friends and they're like, Pimby master. What's up, Mambo? <laughs> that's great. And so that's, it's a great story. And it's a, I think my, my buddy Yao told me that, you know, is the first time he's ever seen the cultural boundary between a Mzungu, a white person, and the Hadzabe be broken. Nice. It required you stepping out there a little bit, though. I mean, you had to be willing Absolutely. to get up and sing and dance, right? Yes. You have to be. And I'm, I mean, that's maybe that goes back to the emotional intelligence piece is that I am, I've always been outgoing, right? And, mm. and, and willing to take risks and, um, emotional risks as well as, as physical risk. And that's kind of an emotional risk. Like a lot of people might be nervous about this, you know, showing up in their true form or being more outgoing in, in different cultural environments. But that's something that's always come, come naturally to me. You know, I think that if I've learned anything from travel, it's that humans are humans and we might have a vastly different cultural background, but basically on the inside, you know, we're similar people. We all have humor. We all have song. We all have love. We all have needs. And we can connect on that level, you know? And I think that's what you were doing, right? Absolutely. Yep. A hundred percent. So have you ever stuck your neck out that way and, and kind of made a fool of yourself and didn't connect with anybody? I'm sure. I'm sure I have. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um yeah, I mean that's that's a part of it, right? You know, sometimes you make the connection, sometimes you don't. Yeah. Um, and some cultures might be more welcome in, to that. Like, you know, I'm not sure. I've never been to you know any northern, very northern countries. I'm, I'm just thinking like Russia or something. But I'm I'm curious on how that would go. I mean, you would have to change your your you have to 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 go with the flow, right? Like, I wouldn't necessarily do that in a place that I didn't feel would welcome it. So you're learning, you're learning how to react along the way and, and like ha- taking in context clues of what are the people doing around you, you know, trying to, trying to blend in as much as possible, but then still being authentic to yourself. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's go back to Tanzania a little bit. What's the landscape like there? Uh, it depends, you know, it's, it's diverse. You know, you got the you got the highest mountain on the continent of Africa at nineteen thousand three hundred forty feet, Mount Kilimanjaro, um, and so that in itself has a bunch of different ecosystems. Um, down around Arusha and that area, it's it's it it's flat, but there are there are a couple other volcanoes there, Mount Meru, um, and there's so rainy season is like the spring season. And so everything is really green and lush. And then come boreal summer, it starts to dry out. And um, so it's diverse. You got, you got highlands in the South, you got Indian ocean that is beautiful on the East coast. Um, You got jungles, you got mountains, you got it all. I mean, it's extremely diverse, amazing, amazing wildlife. When you're leading a trip there, um, what kind of uh, experiences would people expect to have? I mean, there's, if that much of a, if the de- landscape is that diverse, are you trying to show everybody everything or you do specific parts of it? We do. We do, Kurt. And actually, so we lead a lot of trips on Kilimanjaro. Um, and then we have a very unique cultural and wildlife safari. And again, my, with my passion being culture, we actually go and visit the Hadzabe tribe. And they still remember me as the Pembe. 
Um, so, and we actually go, we camp and my, my business partner and Tanzanian brother, he's a half Maasai and half Chaga. So we go to his village, camp out inside of the Boma with the chief. Um, we have a very authentic Maasai experience. Um, and then we end up going to Serengeti national park, uh, for some game drives and Ngorongoro national park as well. Wow. That sounds like a fantastic trip. It's, it's amazing, man. And it's very authentic. You know, you can get tons of different quote unquote safari op- operators that will take you to Serengeti and Ngorongoro, but to visit the Hadzabe and have the authentic Maasai experience is something that I'm extremely passionate about. Um, and it's something that our guests just love is not mean, I mean, I don't think any other tour groups do this. Neat. You know, I think when I went to Kenya, just north of Tanzania, right, then uh, I, I met a lot of the, the Maasai, and it was great. But I also saw some kind of tourism-type stuff where they were bringing Maasai in to do a special dance for people on a stage or something, and that was the Maasai encounter. You know, and I'm like, right. well, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, I mean, Yeah, there, there's tons of that in, in Tanzania, too. Where you basically, the you know, the big tourist buses can go drive by the Boma and pay a certain amount and then go in, get your photo taken, they'll do a dance, and then you leave, you know. Um, which is not something that, you know, it, it lacks a little bit of authenticity, you yeah. know, and it's more of a spectacle, really. You're not getting to know the people. Um, you're just kind of like looking at them and taking photos. I, I mean, I really value um, the relationships that I've built, you know, my time traveling around the world. And maybe that's, I mean, that's probably one of the, the, the best, the best reasons for adventure travel is to meet people and to, to have these relationships, you know, um, I probably wouldn't have an international trekking company if it wasn't for my, my people, you know, the people that we work with, you know, there's a, there's a, um, also saying in South Africa, it's called Ubuntu or a word, and it means you you are nothing without each other. And so I always try to that resonates with me a lot um, to think about like I'm just part of this giant wheel, you know. There's a it's all about the team, and that goes. I mean, for our company in total, I mean we have Wildland Trekking. We probably have 200 employees, <clears throat> like 130 guides, and it's you know we're like the Wildland family. That's what we call it. Mm. Everybody plays an integral role in the operation. Yeah, it sounds like a pretty big operation. So unpack that for us, if you would. Tell us about Wildland Trekking, what they do, and and then about your part of it, the international part. Yeah, so Wildland Trekking started in 2005 by three guys in the Grand Canyon and shortly after Yellowstone, uh, Yosemite, Rocky Mountain Park, pretty much the American West. Um we run trips in the Pacific Northwest now in Great Smoky Mountain National Parks based out of Asheville, North Carolina. Um, and I run the international part of wildland trekking. So we operate in Chilean Patagonia in southern Peru around Cusco. We run a bunch of treks to Machu Picchu. Um, we run treks in the Cordillera Blanca and Huayhuash in central Peru, which are amazing mountains if you haven't been. Uh, we run lots of trips in Ecuador and the Galapagos. Uh, Iceland, we run a lot of trips in Iceland, um, the French, Swiss, and Italian Alps. Uh, we run trips to the Himalayas and Nepal, Everest Base Camp, Annapurna Base Camp, and Langtang National Parks. And then we run trips in Tanzania on Mount Kilimanjaro um, and then do the wildlife and cultural safari. And we're growing. We're growing. Our growth trajectory is is right on online and um, I think in the next couple, I think next year we're going to move into Norway, potentially Northern Vietnam, um, and then potentially Madagascar as well. Wow. Well, here's a question for you. Uh, travel. We both agree how valuable it can be. The life experience, the, the emotional education, the cultural education, just understanding the way that the world works and, you know, seeing another perspective. I, it's so valuable. But here's, here's the question. Why go with you to a, a predetermined destination versus just going it alone and trying to figure it out? Right. Well, there's three th- three main main things that I always answer this question with. One is that we always send a certified wildland guide to bridge that cultural gap. Okay. And so that person kind of holds the guest's hand all the way from the beginning stages 
you know, a month before the trip starts, they help them on their packing list. And, you know, any apprehensions they have, they're there to answer that. They'll pick them up at the airport and they're with them. They're like the liaison or a guide, if you will. They're certified guide. Um, and then they drop them off at the airport. So one is the, the cultural gap. Two is that they are trained in first aid. They have all, all of our guides have wilderness first responders. Um, so if you were to go on your own and you might hire a um, local service, those got quote unquote guides might not have um, first aid training, which is very important um, in travel around the world, you know, to, to uh, do assessments and evaluate your health is, is valuable. Um, the third thing is that all of our guides are trained in risk management. So they're overall responsible for risk management in the front country and the back country part of the trip. And so those are kind of the three main added values. We also have extremely high standards, a standard of excellent. Um, so we have amazing food. Our chefs are, are top, top notch. We have amazing gear, comfortable, comfortable beds and tents. And um, we provide all of the gear. So, you know, say someone in New York city wants to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro, like they might not have the equipment to do so if they don't do it often. So we provide all the gear um, and that's another, another added value. Mm. Well, Hey, tell us a story about a trip where something went completely backwards from what you thought it would, you know, you were saying you have to learn to go with the flow and, and make the most of it. Tell us a story about that. Okay. Well, I don't have any of those stories from wildland trekking because everything goes to plan. Always. I'm sure. Um, <laughs> always. Absolutely. Uh, well, one example would be on our last Everest base camp trip. Um, the weather in Lukla, where you fly from Kathmandu into Lukla, was bad the first couple of days. Um, our itinerary has an extra, has two acclimatization days built into the itinerary. So we didn't we, – we had to wait in Kathmandu for the first couple of days for the weather to clear um, and just sitting around waiting for our window, you know, to fly. And so you got to be super flexible when you travel, you know you're, you're not in control. You know, humans are out of control, especially when it comes to the weather. So the, the, always say the mountains make the rules, you know, we're going to do what the mountains say. And if the mountains allow us to make it to the top of the world, then, then we will. And so, um, that's a good, that's probably a classic example of, of when something didn't go perfectly. It's usually because of the weather. Have you ever in your own personal travels, found yourself like completely lost or you felt like you were um kind of on the wrong side of of the cultural exchange you know you felt like you were actually in a dangerous situation yeah i've certainly been in like sketchy situations um and so you can usually you can usually tell when you have that gut instinct you're like okay this isn't this isn't good you know um but i think you know it's, it's just another experience to reflect on and say why was i feeling that way You know, like what was it, what was, what in my judgment made me feel uncomfortable? Um, I don't think I've ever been harassed by anybody outside of the United States. Um, the world is generally a a pretty, and again, it's how you perceive it, right? Do you perceive the world as an angry, as a hostile place or a friendly place? And I've always had that approach going into places of, these people are awesome, you know, and and being a realist optimist, but really thinking that people are friendly and, um, and it's, it works, you know, (laughs) knock on wood. Well, it's almost as if you you kind of get what you expect, right? You go to people and and you show them generosity and trust and friendliness, and they're going to be inclined to do the same for you, right? Absolutely. As you know, we don't do a lot of product reviews on the Adventure Sports Podcast, but from time to time, we have something interesting that we'd like to share with you, and so this is going to be kind of a fun one. I recently received a new style of snowshoe from Faber. It's the S-Line 540. The S-Line 540, it's a very unique style of snowshoe, and I wanted to do a product review on this because I do a lot of snowshoeing, especially climbing mountains with snowshoes. First, I'm going to start by reading the description off of the website, which is fabersnowshoes.com. That's F-A-B-E-R snowshoes.com. Website says, 
The S Line was designed for backcountry lovers in search of a new experience. This snowshoe ski hybrid is based off our WTD technology and offers great control on all types of terrain. The versatility of the S-Line will provide a gliding feeling when flying over flat surfaces and excitement while going downhill. Even climbs feel effortless with the many traction wings acting as crampons. For an optimal experience, we recommend the use of poles with extra wide baskets alongside the S-Line. You probably gathered from that description that this is not your standard snowshoe. So let me describe it just a little bit. Instead of the traditional teardrop shape that you might have with a snowshoe that normally would have a crampon under the binding that grips the snow, this snowshoe is designed longer and straight. It's about six inches wide and it looks to be maybe 40 inches long. I think the most unique thing about this snowshoe is that it does not have the crampon under the binding, underfoot. Instead, on the toe and on the heel of the snowshoe, it has some skid plates, or anti-skid plates, that kind of work like a climbing skin would on a traditional ski. So you can use those for going uphill or for going downhill with traction, but if you want to kind of slide a little bit, get a little kick and glide out of your snowshoe, then you pull those skid plates off and you can slide downhill kind of like you would on skis. For those of you that have done climbing with snowshoes, you always know that the way down is the most frustrating because you really want a pair of skis at that point. Uh, you're going down, you get a little slide, you don't get as much slide as you would like, and it just seems like, man, if I just had skis or, or something where I could slide a little bit, it would be a lot more fun going down the hill. So that was kind of the inspiration, I think, behind this unique snowshoe. Now, the manufacturer also points out that this snowshoe was designed particularly for breaking fresh trail. And I could see how that would work because of the longer snowshoe, the foot's more balanced in the middle. You have a little bit more rise on the toe to help to get above the snow. And I think that it might be a superior snowshoe for breaking trail. I didn't get a chance to break a lot of new trail on this test because the snow wasn't fresh enough, but I think it would work. Before I go into the performance of this snowshoe, I want to talk a little bit about the construction. I was really impressed with the binding system that attaches to your boot. It has uh, the kind of lever tightening strap bindings that you might find on a snowboard binding. And that made for a very secure place to put your foot. And it also made for an easy way to get strapped in. You know, a lot of snowshoes, you're fighting buckles and, and straps and things. With this one, it, it's pretty straightforward. And it gave a very secure and solid feel to the way that your boot mounts to the snowshoe. And instead of that crampon underneath the foot, it's a little hard to describe, so you might want to go to FaberSnowshoes.com so that you can see this, but the plastic decking that goes between the rails of the snowshoe, they wrap at an angle that allows the, uh, the plastic to grab the snow when you're going uphill to resist sliding, but still to slide when you're going downhill. It's a little bit hard to describe, but imagine the plastic wraps around the rails and creates a one-way friction or a one-way catch that helps you to go up and then also allows you to slide down. The anti-skid plates that are on the toe and the heel of the snowshoe, they attach to the snowshoe with some wire mechanisms that just kind of clip into place, and uh, they held very well. You do have to make sure that you get them in correctly, but they, they did the job. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the performance on this. First, the conditions. It was a, uh, a cold morning, but we had had a lot of warmth the day before. So I was on a hard pack trail initially, and it had become a little bit crusty, a little bit icy even, because it had warmed the day before and then frozen back that night. That makes for a very hard, slippery surface, which is not ideal for going up a steep hill. And so I thought, well, this will really test this crampon-free snowshoes traction trying to go up. When we got to the steeps, though, and when I say steeps, let me describe this, I measured it at about 30 degrees, and 30 degrees is pretty steep. For snowshoeing, that would be an aggressive incline. You will find uh, inclines that are steeper than that if you're trying to climb a mountain, 
but 30 degrees is pretty aggressive. That's a nice steep ski run is a way to think of it. Much steeper than a green. Uh, steeper than most blues even. It's probably a blue-black level ski run. And I walked up the hard pack with this slippery surface with these snowshoes, and I was really surprised that they held. I thought that when I got to the steep glazed part, I would just slide back down the hill. But the reality is they gripped fairly well. Anything greater than 30 degrees, they did start to slide, but keep in mind the conditions, not the greatest. So I got off of the hard pack and I got onto some windblown crust that was soft enough for the snowshoe to grab hold of, and it also did very well there. One thing I should mention, however, is that if there is a side angle to the snow and it's hard packed, so you can't actually kind of stomp a flat surface to stand on, these things will slide sideways. That's where I started missing the crampon, actually, because it's hard to get that lateral stability on that sideways slope. Then we walked a distance around to the north side of the mountain, and we did that to get out of this crusty stuff and to get into some true powder. The powder was several inches deep, probably with a, a two or three foot base underneath it. And so it was nice soft powder. And the snowshoe did about the same in the powder as it did on the harder stuff. Then I decided it was time to try the downhill. So in this powdered area, once again, at about a 30 degree slope, I removed the skid plates from the bottom, put the snowshoes back on and pointed the tips downhill. Now, you have to use a Telemark style for your skiing or sliding on this snowshoe because, of course, you only have a toe mount, and that offers quite a bit more stability. The challenge is that going down a 30-degree slope was a little bit more than this snowshoe was designed for. I pushed it beyond its reasonable limits, I think. It got going pretty quick, and I was trucking on down the slope, but you really can't steer or guide this once it gets going. Now, as the slope moderated a little bit and got down to like 10, 15 degrees, then it began to behave itself a lot more kindly, and I wasn't so worried about going quickly and not being able to steer. But you really don't steer this. It's not intended to be a full-blown ski. It is intended to give you a little kick and glide, a little better slide, without actually skiing a mountain with it. And so on slopes that are more moderate, I think it would be a lot of fun. Then we went back out to where that glazed hard pack was. Again, the slope was about 30 degrees, and I tried going down that. Now, I have to admit, it was a ton of fun. But again, if there had been obstructions in the way, I probably would have ran into them. I couldn't steer it. So this really isn't intended to replace skis. Instead, it's intended to give you a little bit of kick and glide on a moderate slope and with the more narrow and long design of the snowshoe, I felt like it probably would break trail better than a standard snowshoe as long as the slope was not too steep. The problem is, as soon as it gets steep, you start wishing you had a crampon. But it was a ton of fun. So in the end, if you live in an area with gentle hills and you want to go snowshoeing and get a little kick and glide and have a ton of fun, you might consider this because it is a neat way to do it. If you want to do true mountaineering with this snowshoe, I would probably say it wasn't designed for that. Like any other tool, if you use it for what it was designed, then it works. If you try to use it beyond what it was designed for, then, you know, it's going to fail at some point. So there you go. It's kind of a neat idea, a new thing in snowshoeing. So if you are a snowshoeing enthusiast and you've been looking for something that breaks trail well and gives you a little kick and glide, then consider the S-Line by Faber. And again, the website is fabersnowshoes.com. It's a fun snowshoe, not standard, not a ski, but it is something that gives you a little bit of glide versatility, which can be a blast. Planning a new product or your next big trip? Running out of space for those ideas? U.S. Marker Board offers whiteboards and glass boards of every size, color, and surface material to keep you planning. From floor-to-ceiling boards to projectable glass boards for that perfect presentation, custom work is their specialty. U.S. Marker Board is the go-to for planning your team collaboration space. Think your needs are too complex? U.S. Marker Board welcomes the adventure of fulfilling your order. Use promo code ADVENTURE to get 12% off at usmarkerboard.com. 
Well, what is your favorite place that you've been? Uh, that's that's pretty hard. I can say one of your favorites. How about that? What's one of your favorite places that you've ever been in this world? Man, I love the the Himalayas. So that including northern India, Nepal, Tibet, um, parts of China. I absolutely love the the mountains there, the rivers there, and I love the the people. Um, you can find a lot of diversity in the people. Primarily, they're Buddhist and Hindu. Um, and, and my from my experience, everybody is just absolutely lovely. You know, mm-hmm. like they're not their happiness is is different than you might see in the United States. They, you know, they don't have much monetarily, but they live in beautiful mountains and that their culture is rich. There's a, there's a high level of respect among one another in the children. And they're, they're very just wonderful people. They're passionate about the mountains. They're, they're compassionate toward each other. And yeah, I think I would say Nepal and Northern India, Tibet, that's probably my one of my favorite destinations. You know, you hear people kind of philosophize about uh, the connection between the landscape and the indigenous people of the area, right? Um, yeah. How do you think the landscape impacts the culture for the people that live there? How how much is that true versus something we like to imagine? I think it, it it's a hundred percent real. It a hundred percent affects everything in the culture. Well, the more dramatic the the landscape is. The hardier, the hardier the landscape is, the hardier the, the people have to be. Right. Um, you know, and, and you can see that in the United States too. Like it's not easy necessarily to live in, say, Crested Butte, where it's, you know, negative 20 some of the time and you got snow until June. Uh, it's easier to live in a, you know, the East Coast where it's warmer and you don't have to wear as many clothes and it's it's just easier. So um I think in the mountains, it takes a very hardy and resourceful person um, and culture to to un- understand that adversity. You know, I think like once things become so hard, it makes things a little bit easier when they're when they're not as hard. Does that make sense? I, uh, that... Explain that a little bit. When when things get really hard, it makes it easier when they're not as hard. In what way? Right. So if, say for example, you're you're climbing Mount Everest like that or some other big mountain, like that's going to be a a challenge, right? Like that is a, a a physical and mental challenge. So that when that's hard, it's hard. And then you come back to the regular, your regular life and things might not be as hard as you once thought they were. Mm. So in a sense, you're building emotional resiliency. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. No doubt about it. I mean, that's one of the main reasons to do adventure. It's because we learn so much about ourselves and others, but we learn so much about ourselves, we find out what we're capable of. And then when we come right. back and to the everyday life, we're just better equipped. And it's all transferable, you know? Um, there's like a, a theory, a, the, the, the go hard, or the try harder theory. You know, if you're on a rock climb or um, on a rat or, you know, on a river and you don't think you can make that move, you tell yourself, to try harder with the empower of intention. You tell yourself, try harder. And usually it works. Um, <laughs> I needed that on Saturday, man. <laughs> I, I, was, right? oh, yeah. I was on some uh, extreme skiing at CB at Crested Butte and the snow conditions are still a little thin. Man, I ended up over a, a cliff and the snow was, was just really, really super chunky. And I needed to make several quick turns, but the snow was so unpredictable. I was like, if I don't make that turn, I'm going over the cliff but I'm not sure about the snow conditions. You know what I mean? It was one of those yeah. moments where I needed that. I needed that try harder, you know? Right. And that, I mean, that's a, that's a proven theory with, with myself. It's like, if I'm, and that's so transferable back to business. And I think, of the, you know, a lot of the skills that I developed along the way in the mountains and on the rivers around the world is this um, resiliency and having the ability to try harder. And so now, you know, I work a lot of admin hours on my computer and manage the whole program. And so sometimes I got to tell myself to try harder and, and, um, keep calm during adversity, you know? So you really learn how to manage your stress and, um, your overall awareness 
of yourself becomes enhanced. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. What would you say would be one of your? And I don't, I, I'm not asking you to speak bad of a place, but I do want to know what place was the biggest disappointment. You know, you went there and you had a set of expectations, and in the end, you're like, Neh, maybe that didn't turn out the way I thought. That is an interesting question, right? I think, hmm, I think, it, I think it, to to go back to your question about expectations is an important part of that question. And, um, usually I kind of have, I don't have too many expectations that are pretty vague. Um, and I don't, and I think that's where not being disappointed helps. Right. So I wouldn't say I've been to any place and been completely like this place is terrible. Um, like I think there's always a choice in how you look at the world. Um, and so finding, finding something unique or cool about that place, um, is something that I strive to do all the time. I think that's well said really, because if we have a whole bunch of super well-defined expectations, we're going to be disappointed. But if we go in and say, my expectation is to have an experience, to know this place, to learn its ways, then we're not going to be disappointed by that. Right. Right. Absolutely not. You know, it's funny. I, I, did a little trip where I took a family, a group, I guess there are about 10 of us backpacking. And we went to a place that was so remarkable. I mean, it should be one of the little mini wonders of the world, just amazing rock formations and creeks that go underground and arches and it just a, a landscape that was so cool. And we did primitive backpacking and camping. And at the end, there are a bunch of teenage girls there. I said, what did you think? How did you like it? And they're like, meh. I said, what do you mean? Well, we thought we were going to be singing songs around a campfire. Right. I'm like, well, we didn't do that. You're right. We go go car camping next time in a campground. How about that? <laughs> and I was kind right. of laughing because they just had an expectation. So they were a little disappointed. But I think that kind of illustrates the thing, right? If if we have a more open mindset, then we get a great experience. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, one of our main, the main things that I do with the Wildland Trek International is manage guest expectations, right? Like guests are always going to have an expectation, um, but to have this like kind of structural structure their expectation, but being able to flex within that, I think is is super important. Um, and usually the expectation, um, as far as the quality of our service is is good, um, but you know the the sights and smells and tastes of of a, a place are usually bl- you know blow expectations out of the water. Oh yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about Wildland Trekking. And for more information, it's wildlandtrekking.com, right? That's where people can see your website. But what kind of people are going on these trips? I mean, do they need to be already skilled in in the backcountry? Do you have a variety of levels of trips? I mean, how does all that work? Yeah, we we don't have um, any kind of uh, precursor. The people need to be uh, able to walk. That's good. You know, that's the the first thing. Um, they need to be open minded. Usually, our demographic is about thirty to to seventy. Probably the average being you know forty five. A lot of people have never hiked before, um, and so we do have a level of you know one to five. Five being the hardest, one being the easiest. And so we run three different types of trips. We were on backpacking trips where they're self sufficient. You have a guide. Um, the guide's carrying the gear. You're carrying parts of the gear. Um, you're self-sufficient. So they're like little backpacking expeditions. We also run hut-to-hut or end-to-end trips where you're basically carrying a day pack and you're hiking from um, like hotel to hotel or tea house to tea house, depending on where you're at. Right. Um, and we have porters for those. And so carrying a day pack is is pretty manageable for most people. Um, and then we run lodge based trips as well, where we're up in these, we put our guests up in these nice bed and breakfasts or quaint hotels, and then we take them on day trip, day hikes. So those are our three main trip styles. Um, and I would say the lodge base is, is the most luxurious. Um, the hut to hut or end to end trips are, you can really explore a lot of the areas, because you're only carrying a day a day pack and we right. have porters, um, and then the backpacking trips. If you want to work hard, um, 
and really have some some kind of harder adventure, then those are for those kind of folks. So we we cater to to a lot of different people. Right on. Well, it sounds delightful. So it sounds like anybody who wants to try essentially trekking, just use the word trekking, they can do it any way that they're comfortable with with your company, right? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Well, how do you yep. uh, how do you sign up for a trip or choose a trip? There's so many to choose from. What would you recommend? Yeah, so if I would recommend just going to our website, like you said, www.wildlandtrekking.com, and you can see all of our different options there, domestic options um, all over the United States, and then all of our international options are under global destinations, um, and you can register online. It's, it's pretty easy. We have about 10 adventure consultants that are making all the reservations and on the phones and on the emails and um, we have 24 seven support from them. So they're, they know all of the logistics. They know how you know, they can answer any questions about any of our trips. And, and that's a, it's a nice resource, you know, to have somebody, you know, if you have questions to be able to answer those questions immediately. We do a lot of shows on backpacking. I know that a lot of our listeners have never been backpacking and they want to get started. And I'm looking at all the just U S destinations you guys have here. Man, this might be a great way to dip your toe in the water a little bit without having to buy the gear and, and having someone with the experience there to help you through. Uh, might be a great way to learn whether backpacking is really for you or not, you know? Yeah, I think I think you nailed it with that, Kurt. Like, get out there and try it, you know? There's always going to be something inside of you, and this this is just a natural response where you're like, I'm not going to try that. That sounds scary or uncomfortable, but it's all learning. It's, it's a brilliant way to learn about yourself. You know, like what does sleeping outside feel like for me? Um, or what does, you know, hiking up to Everest Base Camp feel like around the biggest mountains in the world? You know, you're learning about yourself and how, how you react and how you respond. I'm looking at your global destinations too. Ecuador, European Alps, Iceland, Nepal, Peru, Patagonia, Tanzania. I mean, it's all there. Machu Picchu, Cordillera, Kilimanjaro, Himalayas. I mean, everything here looks so good. It's it's a good man. It's it's a it's a fun it's a fun job, and it's a it's. I mean, you know, you know, Mary Oliver. I do not the author. She has a quote that basically says, "What are you going to do with your one and precious life? You know, you got one chance to live your life. What are you going to do with it?" And so I've always you know taken that into perspective like you gotta gotta get out there and explore you know explore these places but explore yourself in these places yeah i agree i agree so what is next on the horizon for you i mean you've done so much travel and now you've got this company going what's your future what are your dreams right well in one week from today i head down to patagonia to lead a trip uh the end of april i'm leading a trip in ecuador um Cordillera Huayhuash in Peru in June, uh, Kilimanjaro in July, in August, and then maybe back. We got a really, really cool trip on the horizon. Um, we're going to do a llama packing trip around a sacred mountain in Peru called Asangate. And so I'm going to run a pilot trip there in September, which is, I mean, that's going to be an amazing. You get a Rainbow Mountain. Have you heard of that? No. It's a check out Rainbow Mountain, but we're going to run a, a llama packing trip there. No other operator does that. So that's pretty exciting. We're also going to open up a Cotopaxi Lodge based trip. Cotopaxi is one of the biggest volcanoes in Ecuador. And we essentially have these like this itinerary. It's a lodge based trip. So you're in this really nice lodge and we do day hikes. And then with the ultimate goal of climbing Cotopaxi. Nice. And so that's, per, that's pretty exciting. And yeah, I mean, living the dream right now, you know, I think in the future, what one of my, one of our main goals is to start a nonprofit where we are really putting a certain percent of each program into an international nonprofit that takes care and gives back to the, the places, the lands and the people that we work with. Like, that's what I want to leave behind for the next generation is like really doing something good and do what's right for this planet. Yeah, right on. I like that. Well, Seth, thank you so much for sharing with us today about your traveling, your love for travel, the value of travel, and also about a, a great way to do it with wildland trekking. That's cool, man. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you, Kurt, man. It's nice talking to you. 
Yeah, have a great day. And for all the listeners out there, ah, travel like this is so valuable. You know, plan a trip. But until the next show, make sure you get out there, however you do it, and have some fun. Why don't you do yourself and us a favor and become a member of our Facebook group. In there, you can hear about some awesome adventures, learn how to do new ones, and share what you've been up to. And while you're on the web, do us a favor and go over to patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast and consider becoming a patron to help the show. You can also find a link to patron at the top of our website at adventuresportspodcast.com. As always, thanks for listening, guys.